Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you to an episode of the AdCast. Today, I have a mentor and someone that I look up to and I listen to. And, you know, Drew, you have no idea how many nights I've listened to your podcast and went to sleep, listened to it on my way to work, and just gotten so much value from it. I have Mr. Drew McClellan on the line today from the Agency Management Institute. And we're going to talk about ad agencies today and also post-COVID. This is the AdCast. You're listening to the AdCast. There's three things that I tell people to focus on. That's your budget, your media, and your message. People don't call it the truth. Every day I'm hustling, 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 hustling. If you hustle, you'll never go hungry. Hustle and motivate. Hustle and motivate. That's why they follow me on. I think I know the way. You're listening to the AdCast. I want to welcome you to this episode of the AdCast. I have my guest, Mr. Drew McClellan, here uh, from the Agency Management Institute. This gentleman has a long, impressive resume and frequent trips to Disney as well. We're going to talk about that today, too. Uh, so, Drew, I know that I know you well, and I've been following you for some time. But let's, uh, let's introduce you to the folks that, that have never heard of you before. Sure. So what I heard from your intro was uh, you listen to me when you need to go to sleep. That's what, that's <laughs> what I heard from that intro. Huh. So uh, my name is Drew McClellan, and I've been in the agency business my whole life. So uh, while I was in college, uh, one of my adjunct professors was the creative director at Gray in Minneapolis and offered me a, a freelance gig. And I just never looked back. So I have owned my own agency. Uh, we're 25 uh, in 2020, and I still am active in my own agency. And about mm, 15 years ago or so, I bought Agency Management Institute. So when I started my agency, mm-hmm. I was 30 years old. It was the perfect combination of arrogance and ignorance. I thought, how hard, oh, how hard can it be to run an agency, right? <clears throat> and then I learned very quickly, oh, crap, I don't know what I'm doing. So I sought out an organization that helped agency owners run the business of their business Mm -hmm. and completely changed the way I ran my agency. And we immediately got more profitable, uh, got smart about who to work with and who not to work with. And then fast forward, you know, another 15 years and that founder, the founder of that company wanted to retire, asked me to buy his business. And um, long story short, I did and have completely changed it from what it was. As you might imagine, he started it in the nineties. But today we serve 250 to 300 agencies a year, yep. small to mid-sized agencies. So most people are under 100 people. And our job is to help them run their business better so they can scale, so they can have less of the ups and downs. They can be more sustainable. And if they want to down the road, they can sell the business. Absolutely. So, so Drew, you said like you started when you were 30 years old, which was kind of the perfect time for you. Now, what would Drew today go back and say to Drew back then? If, if you had the DeLorean and, and you had uh, the Doc, Doc Brown in the front seat, and you can go back in time. What would you tell Drew from, uh, you know, at 30 years old? Yeah, I would have told him to specialize and not be a generalist. I would have told him to, and some of this stuff I sort of did accidentally, Mm -hmm. um, but I would have told him to establish a position of authority or thought leadership or a a position of expertise where people would begin to seek him out Mm -hmm. for his counsel and that that would drive business for the agency. Um, I would tell him everything that's in the book that just came out recently, Sell with Authority, that that I wrote with the co-author Stephen Westner. Is that still a big issue with a lot of agencies now where they become a generalist? Well, they are generalist agencies and they don't specialize. Yeah, I, I think it's, um, you know, it's human psychology. You think, okay, if I'm only going to work with HVAC providers across the U.S., there's a million businesses who are going to come knocking on my door that aren't that, and they are all carrying a bag of money that they want to give me. And so, why would I say no to that money? And mm-hmm. I particularly hear, um, well, you shouldn't specialize in times like this when we're in an economic, uh, you know, depression or recession or whatever you want to call what we're in right now, because people will point to a specific industry and say, well, I'm so glad I wasn't in the travel and tourism industry mm-hmm. because I'd be out of business. And honestly, my agencies that specialize in travel and tourism were some of the ones that bounced back fastest. Wow. Uh, when when everything shut down, because 
when people are in crisis, when businesses are in crisis, they don't want a generalist. They want a specialist. That's and true. So the agencies that specialize get through tough times much faster because they're sought after in a much more significant way than a generalist. So why, why do you think some agencies are, are afraid to be the specialist? I think they see it as scarcity as, a, in, as opposed to abundance. But the reality is a generalist is bound by geography. Like no one's going to fly over or drive past 20 agencies to get to your agency if mm -hmm. you serve the same butcher, baker, and candlestick maker that everybody else does. But if you are a specialist in your field, then uh, clients don't care where you live. Mm -hmm. They care that you're a specialist. And so while you are right in that you can't serve everyone in your local geography, and that may feel like um, you're restraining yourself, the reality is you've now broadened your market mm -hmm. to probably your entire country or beyond your country, mm -hmm. um, depending on where you are. And you know, in Europe, it's easy to cross from one country to another. So um, it's, a, it's a false sense of scarcity. That's that's what makes them nervous. So, and you, Drew, you travel, I, I don't want to say across the country, because you've, you've traveled all over the world doing this. And, and so when you are doing a workshop with an agency, do they kind of have some resistance on saying, like, I don't want to go this, or I'm fearful, I'll lose revenue if I become a specialist? I mean, do you run across that? And how do you coach them through that? Yeah, you know, um, I, I, I'm a firm believer in sort of meeting people where they're at and then helping them decide where they want to go. And it's my job to help them get there. So if an agency owner doesn't want to specialize, I'm not going to shove that down their throat. Right. I, I think, I think it's a better choice, mm -hmm. but I also know there are a lot of good generalist agencies out there. So uh, it just is recognizing what the boundaries are based on your choices. So if you want to be a generalist, I'll help you be the best generalist you can be, but we have to be realistic about what, constraints come with that decision. And so if somebody is on the fence, I'm happy to have conversations with them about the pros and cons of specialization. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to help them figure out how they could specialize. The truth is most agencies are closer to being specialists than they think. Mm. So they may not claim, they may not claim it. They may not say, look, we only work with rural healthcare systems. But when you look at their roster of clients, 70% of them are rural healthcare systems, right? Yep. So, they, so really what they're doing is they are specialists. They're just not taking advantage of it. So when I help them understand that this is our, when you look at your case studies, when you look at your website, when you look at all this, you are already leaning in that direction. But the part you're missing out on is the accelerant that brings clients directly to you because you declare to the world, this is your specialty. So, so it's really more about, it's really more about admitting it and owning it than it is becoming it. So in your experience with coaching a lot of these agencies and, and doing some of these workshops, when they specialize, do they scale? Do they normally oh, scale? Oh gosh, yeah, sure. Because all of a sudden now, I mean, think about it. If I'm a generalist, what trade shows do I go to? Mm -hmm. uh, what mailing list do I mail to? Who do I make phone calls to? What does my content look like? But when I'm a specialist, when all I do is I help HVAC franchisees take advantage of their national brand. Mm -hmm. Now I know exactly what trade shows to go to. I know exactly who to mail to. I know exactly what. So they absolutely scale because they're much more targeted in everything they do. And they're much more findable. You know, if you Google agent advertising agency, what are the odds that you're going to show up first on anybody's Google search? Right, right. But if you start Googling, you know, uh, ad agency, pharma for women over 50, there aren't a lot of those. Mm. So all of a sudden, you're much more findable. Oh, and by the way, you're going to be the one that gets invited to speak at conferences and do other things because you have a depth of expertise, right? Yep. So, so scale happens pretty quickly. What, what are you Assuming saying? that all the other things aren't broken, right? I mean, if your agency is broken, you don't have systems and process. If your work is mediocre, then no specialization is going to fix that. You bring up a good topic of process, um, and I heard uh, there was a, there was a few episodes that you talked about. Pod, I mean, uh, process inside your podcast.
But there's one thing that actually stood out. I can't remember what episode number it was, but you said uh, you talked about specialization and you compared it to a general dentist and then the orthodontist. And you said the orthodontist makes more money because he straightens teeth. You know, absolutely. Right. I mean, think about it. What you're going to pay a general practitioner to give you a flu shot and what you're willing to pay Mayo Clinic if you have a brain tumor. Very different. Right. So you respect their expertise differently and you understand it comes with a price difference. Right. And you're happy to pay it because you're getting exactly what you need at the highest level of expertise. That's true. So now, you know, Drew, we do you. List out some of the things that some of the big mistakes that you see agencies make. If, if we could just, just say five things that you see a lot of, it doesn't have to be five, but what are some of the mistakes that you see agencies make a lot of? Uh, the first one is they don't understand the agency math, which is different than normal accounting math or regular math. There are certain metrics and sort of benchmarks that agency owners should really be running their agency by every single month. And when you don't understand those, then um, it's, you make bad decisions. So I'll give, you, I'll give you a great example. One of the core metrics that every agency should run their business by is, let me back up. Let's define AGI first. So the first mistake agencies make is they yep. care about revenue, That's which right. is absolutely irrelevant, irrelevant, right? So I can have two agencies that both bill $10 million. One of them is a media agency. And they're only going to have a million dollars to actually run their business because most of that 10 million is pastors, pastors, right? The other one is a PR shop at 10 million and they're going to have $9 million to run their agency because they don't have a lot of outside costs. So revenue is irrelevant. The number every agency owner should be tracking every single month is adjusted gross income. And the way you get that number is super simple. It's gross revenue minus all of your cost of goods, including any 1099s or contractors if you're outside of the US that you have. And what's left is adjusted gross income. And you use the adjusted gross income to actually run your business. That's the money you get to keep. Yep. And so that's the money you spend on salaries, overhead, and profit. So that's the biggest mistake agency owners make is that they think revenue, not AGI. The next one uh, that they make is that they don't use AGI as the building block for all decisions. So probably the most violated agency metric is you should have $150,000 of adjusted gross income per full-time person. Mm. So again, if you're, if you're an agency that is, is got $300,000 of AGI, you should be two people, including the owner. And remember, these are only people who are on, who are on payroll, not contractors. Mm-hmm. But you know what happens in every agency, and I'm sure it happens in yours, is when a new project comes in, people come to you and go, Eric, we can't possibly do this work without hiring some more people. And, you know, what do we know, right? As agency owners, we go, oh, well, you know what? Everyone's pretty busy, it seems. And, and so, okay, we'll hire someone. Well, Great point. Odds are, odds are you don't need that person. You mm-hmm. need some efficiency in some other place, or maybe you've got a mediocre player that needs to be replaced with someone else because they're not really pulling their weight. Mm-hmm. But the last thing in the world you need to do is burden your agency with another loaded salary. So that's probably that's probably the number one violation. So every one of your listeners should crunch their numbers. And the easiest way to do this is go back to 2019 and, and, and look at your year-end numbers and say, okay, here is my gross revenue. Here's my cost of goods. I've now figured out what my AGI is. Divide that by 150000 and that'll tell you what your staff size should be. And nine listeners out of 10 are overstaffed. That's you, the biggest you, mistake. I, I agree with you. I'll, I'll be honest with you. When I first started listening to you years ago, when you were talking AGI, I was like, what is he talking about? I was like, we, we right. booked this much money in media. So like some people think like, okay, I booked $10 million in media. And then right. they have no idea truly in what the size of their agency is. They're like, everyone's busy. Uh, so, you know, I, I must need more people. And, and then the next thing you know, at the end of the day on their balance sheet, they're making nothing. They're making right. nothing at all. Right. It's, you know, when, when an agency owner calls me and says, we're working our tail off but I can't get over 3% profit or 5% profit. And I have them send me their financial forms. That's the very first metric I right. check because it's almost always one of the leading offenders. Mm-hmm. So that's, so those are a couple of mistakes. You're not managing by rev, you're managing by revenue, not AGI and you're overstaffed because you're not using that metric. Another mistake agencies make is that 
they will rifle through project management systems because this one doesn't work or that one doesn't work. And what they don't stop to think about or they don't want to admit is the common problem is you people, the people who are working the system, right? Mm -hmm. So whether it's teamwork or work a jig or base camp or whatever, I mean, they all have their different levels of sophistication right. and different sized agencies are a right fit for all of those. But they all do their job. And when they don't work, it's typically not the tool's fault. It's that people are not actually using the tool properly. Mm -hmm. You haven't defined a uh, agency-wide system for how to use the tool. So you just go through, you know, onboarding expense after onboarding expense, looking right. for the one that's going to make everybody actually do what they don't want to do, whether that's timesheets or, you know, project entry or creative briefs or whatever it may mm -hmm. be. So it's not, it's typically not the tool that's now, another big mistake some agencies make is they don't do timesheets every day. And, you know, I know there are lots of other advisors out there who are like, oh, you don't need to do timesheets. I'm sorry, but that's crap. Uh, I, I don't like to do them. Nobody is, oh, I'm excited. I get to do timesheets. Mm -hmm. But timesheets are the foundational data that you need to run your business. And it's not, it has nothing to do with billing. It has to do with how are the assets inside your agency being used are they being efficient? Are they being effective? Are your estimates right or wrong? Mm -hmm. You know, it's all those sorts of things that timesheets tell us. Timesheets are so revealing, but they have to be done every day. Otherwise, they're about 67% less accurate. Yeah, or you may not know exactly if you're really making money off of a client. Right, right. You can't check profitability of a client. You don't have any idea if the employee you're paying 50 grand to is bringing you only $33,000 in revenue mm -hmm. before all the other expenses. You just, it, you are running your agency blind without them. Right. And I think, I think other agency advisors are loved because they tell you, you don't have to do timesheets, but they're doing you a disservice. Right. So, but they definitely have to make some hard decisions though. Um, so like if you tell them, hey, you're overstaffed, you know, and look at your AGI and your numbers. So then they have to make some hard decisions, but the business decisions. Right. <clears throat> right. And, you know, I mean, part of my job is to help them make those decisions. And how do we make those compassionately, humanely? Uh, you know, where are other places we can cut? Um, there, there are always options. There's never just one solution, right. right? Right. But it is my job to help to hold the mirror up and say, okay, it's your business and you can run it any way you want, but it's my job to show you the consequences of the decisions you're making. And are these consequences what you are willing to accept mm -hmm. for you and your family? Because a lot of times agency owners, as a general rule, agency owners are super, are wicked smart, are super generous and typically have a twisted sense of humor. Part of why I enjoy working with them. Oh, you're talking about me, Drew. <laughs> I know that that generosity, though, is often at their own family's expense. So when I help them understand that, look, you have two extra people on your staff. And what that means is that you're, you've got $80,000 leaving your business that could fall down to the bottom line and could fund college funds for your kids. It could fund your retirement. Mm. It could fund whatever it is. So you're literally robbing from your own family because you don't want to have the difficult decision or the difficult conversation about right sides in your staff. So that's my job is just to help them understand the consequences of the choices they're making and then help them make better choices and figure out how to execute against those choices. Well, how about one of the mistakes we, we talked about were that agencies make uh, pricing? And I know that sure. the pricing alone is something big because it, it changed our world. The way we price and contract and have processes. Is that another big mistake where you see agencies are afraid to ask for what the value that they bring? Yeah, and I think it's even more complicated than that, right? So I think it's, here's what happens. Here's how every agency on the planet puts together an estimate. They either literally or figuratively walk around the room and they say, Eric, how long is it going to take you to design that thing? Drew, how long is it going to take you to write that thing? Babette, how many account service hours do you want? And then they add them up. They multiply it by their billable rate, which, by the way, the U.S. average should be $150, or $150 an hour. Um, they multiply it, and then they give it to the client. But what's happened is 
Eric and Drew and Bad Bat have all said, oh, I, that's easy. I can do that in two hours. But what they don't factor in is my baby kept me up all night. Um, the dog threw up right before I left. I'm mm-hmm. worried about my kid who's flunking out of school. Mm-hmm. I have to, in the middle of this, I have to take a phone call from my dad's doctor. So they don't take into account real life. They think in this ideal, pristine world where I will not get interrupted for three hours, which let's face it, that never, never happens. happens. Never right? happens. Um, I can get it done. So our estimates are always, 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 always short. So, <clears throat> I've devised a hack that I teach in all of our workshops and I just call it the Drew estimation hack. And what it is, is everybody should do their estimates and then they should multiply them by somewhere between 1.3 and 1.5. And the, and, and the factor of that is really like, how bad are we at this? And then honestly, that's what, that's actually the real number. So we had an agency that um, they were in single digit profitability we implemented this for 90 days. The account service people said clients are going to have a cow. Clients are going to say no. So in 90 days, two things happened. One, so we took every estimate and mul- multiplied it by 1.3 for 90 days. Mm-hmm. No exceptions. Um, one, only one client one time pushed back on price. One, that's it. And two, they moved from about a 4% profit to a 12% profit. In wow. Time. Right. Because their ac- their estimates were more accurate. That's and that's where it needs to be. So, Drew, yeah. what we're going to do is we're going to take a break, and then we're going to actually come back and talk about do agencies know their value? This is the AdCast. You don't need a marketing agency. You do deserve very important placement. VIP Marketing and Advertising is a cutting-edge strategic digital, creative, media, and marketing partner that provides services for businesses of all sizes. To stay up to date on the latest marketing news, subscribe for email updates at veryimportantplacement.com. Today's show is sponsored in part by Craft Creative. Change your creative, change your world with premium video production and graphic design. Get started by visiting wecraftcreative.com. You're listening to the AdCast, the podcast for marketers and advertisers with your host, Eric Elliott. All right, so I am back uh, on the AdCast with my guest, my very special guest, Mr. Drew McClellan. Uh, and we were talking about just agencies pricing and how uh, sometimes they don't know how to price. And, and now I want to pick up that conversation and talk about do agencies know the value that they bring? I would say some do, um, and I would say those are typically the ones who um, have a depth of expertise in something that they know the client really needs. Um, I, but I would not equate that they understand the value and that they price the value properly, right? Mm. So I think a lot of agencies know that they bring great value to their client. Mm-hmm. Where I think agencies struggle is in asking for an appropriate price for that value, right? So I think we are, first of all, in most agencies, the salesperson is the agency owner. Right. Um, and agency owners tend to be um, a little humble and they are not natural salespeople. So they're so anxious to get the sale because it just is one thing to check off their list that a lot of times they undervalue what they do to get the sale. And, and here's the deal. If your listeners, if, if they never hear no, then that's the number one way to know that you are underpricing yourself. Mm -hmm. If someone never pushes back on your pricing, um, then you've got a problem, right? So, so number one, that number two, we often um, shoot ourselves in the foot by having a lack of price integrity. So for example, if you came to me and said, Drew, I'd like your agency to do a website. And I say, great, we do our due diligence. We come back to you with a proposal and their proposal says the website's going to be $30,000. And you go, oh, and by the way, I've asked you for your budget 12 times and you've told me you don't have one. You just want to see what I come back with. Right. Not, not that our clients do that to you, right. but right. So I come back and you go, ooh, $30,000. Gosh, I only had about $23,000. And then what I, the agency owner, do is go, okay, we can do it for 23. 
And now what I've taught the client is you can bend. never accept the first price. And I was trying to take advantage of you by asking for 30 when I could do it for 23. Mm -hmm. So we are our own worst enemy when it comes to sales and pricing and those kinds of things, because we capitulate to clients. So, you know, really what we should say at that instance is, oh, <clears throat> sounds like you did figure out your budget. Great. For $23,000, let's look at this $30,000 proposal, and we need to pull $7,000 worth of value out of it. Great. So let's think about what we could do as a phase two or something down the road that will get you what you need for $23,000. But obviously, I can't do this $30,000 worth of work right. for $23,000. But we don't do that. You know, it, it, when you think about it, no other profession where you would, you know, you don't go to see an attorney and they go, it's $300 an hour and you go, hmm, kind of wanted 150 and they go, oh, all right, I'll do it. Right, right. It never happens, right? So we just, we just need to have more integrity around our own price. So Drew, what do you get the most out of it? Cause that, you know, like I, I know I love what I do so much, but what kind of feeling do you get out of helping an agency owner or is there a time when you walk away and like, and you're like, wow, I, I, that was a great project to work on. So what is the satisfaction that you get out of helping agency owners? Pretty much every day, someone will say to me two things, man, I wish I had known about you 15 years ago. I did. Because, because I, I would have done things very differently. And two, I am going to be able to sleep better. I, I'm running my business better. I'm going to worry less. I have more confidence in what we're doing. So if I can make somebody feel like they're running their business uh, smarter and that they're taking better care of their family mm -hmm. and that they're worried a little less about all the ups and downs that come with agency ownership, mm -hmm. that's pretty gratifying. That's pretty gratifying. So let's talk about the workshops. I mean, if someone were to hire the AMI to do a workshop, what are some of the things that they can expect uh, within a workshop? I don't want you to give away too much of your own secret sauce because I want people to call you and contact you. So what are some of the things that they should expect from an, from an owner workshop? Well, you know, we, we do live workshops or public workshops all the time. And so, you know, that you're going to be in a room with 25 to 50 other agency owners and we're going to learn together. Mm -hmm. And um, there's incredible value in that because everybody shows up as both the student and the teacher. So you're not just learning from me or whoever I'm teaching with, but you're learning from each other. And you're also making connections and you've got people to call after the workshop to talk and commiserate with. So I love that, which is really the precursor to the peer groups that we have. So think of a Vistage group mm -hmm. or a Young Presidents Club. So these people, this set of of agency owners, same people every time, come together every six months and hang out. They learn from each other. They they celebrate each other. They sometimes they cry with each other, but they are sort of each other's board of directors. Absolutely. And I'm there for those. I'm there for those two and a half days to coach and teach and keep them on track and keep them well fed and point them to the bar and all the important things that mm -hmm. that I do. If somebody hires us to come in individually for them, like we're going to come on site to their shop, then there is no set thing. We're going to really identify what they're trying to do and what, where they're stuck. And it's my job in that day or two days or however long I'm on site, it's my job to get them unstuck and put together a plan mm -hmm. for them to move forward. So sometimes we're facilitating strategic planning. Sometimes we're working with a leadership team. Sometimes we're sitting in a conference room for 12 hours with the owner and the CFO trying to sort out their financials and figure out where things are broken and what we can do to fix them. You know, sometimes we are meeting with all kinds of staff people and providing direction and coaching. So it's very individualized at the, at the agency level. Mm -hmm. The workshops obviously are more specific. They're, you know, structured for two days of learning for agency owners. Do, do you... Do you think uh, agencies find it very hard for themselves to uh, be competitive out there with other folks? And, and, and do they market themselves as well as they should? No, and I hate to sound like a broken record, but this is where specialization really helps, right? Yep. So you do. Here's the deal. When I, um, when I teach a workshop and I ask every agency owner to stand up 
tell us their name, where they are from, and tell us about their agency, three-fourths of them are going to say some variation of, we're a full-service integrated marketing agency. And I said, do you see the problem there? Right yeah, there. Yeah. Like, you all yeah. sound and look the same. Yeah. And as opposed to someone who says, you know, we, we are the marketing agency for the building uh, products industry. We know more about building products than anybody else. And that's all we do. That's who, when everyone sits down, that's who you remember in the room mm -hmm. because they're different. So specialization is one of the ways to differentiate yourself. You, it, you can't tell me it's your people because other agencies have good people. Right. You can't tell me that it's because you win awards because other agencies win awards. The reality is how are you my best choice as a business owner to, for getting to my goals? What is it that you can do for me that no one else can? And until you can answer that question, then it's pretty hard for you to say we're different than everyone else because the, the painful truth is you're not. Do you think now this, here's what I've seen, you know, over the last few years, this year in September, we'll be 11 years old, which is, I think, great. You know, it um, is awesome. yeah. it, it's, it's great. Um, I've seen this crazy shift. You remember the Applebee's and a lot of the chain restaurants, how a lot yeah. of them are not around. And then everyone would go into this almost not a hole in the wall, but a smaller locally owned place that has better yeah. food, better service. I'm seeing a lot of agencies uh, turn into those smaller shops and I'm seeing some clients or some brands go to those smaller shops to be able to get that same kind of service. And they're like, I was missing out on this. Do you see that happening a lot, Drew? Yeah. So here's, here's the good news. However you want to run your agency, there are right clients for you out there. So if you want to be the super high touch, super localized, connected to everything in the community mm -hmm. and that people know who you are and know that if they come to your agency, A, they're getting you the owner and B, that they're going to just get this white glove service. Absolutely. Mm. If that's what the client cares about, then that's great. And, you know, we do, we do custom research every year where we go out and talk to clients. We call it the agency edge series. And I don't know, we've been doing it for eight, nine years. And one of the things that we know is that there are some clients who absolutely want that very tight personal relationship with their agency. Mm. But what we also know is typically those are smaller businesses with smaller budgets. Right. If you, if you aspire to work with fewer and larger clients, then that's probably not the way to position yourself. Now you've got to position yourself and you've got to be able to demonstrate a return on investment every single day for what you do. So you've got to A, be ready to cross over the line from marketing into sales. Mm -hmm. B, you've got to bake measurability into everything you do. So yes, I think there are absolutely clients who are looking for the kind of agency you just described. And I think those agencies can make a fine living being just that. So it starts with figuring out what are you trying to build and why? Mm -hmm. And then who's going to be attracted to what you're trying to build and how do you, how do you connect with them and bring them into the fold as clients? You, you mentioned like when you do the workshops, the majority of the folks will stay at stand up and say, yeah, we have a full service integrated marketing agency. Now, right. when which by you, the way is, is not accurate. It, exactly. Right? No, no, no 12 person agency in today's world can really be full service and integrated. Yep. There's just too many complications and sophistications in the work we do today. So they're, they are partnering with somebody somewhere along the way. Exactly. Like when you say you're full service and you have to do mailers, but you're not printing mailers in house, you have to hire a third party to do that. So. Right. 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 So let's just say now out of all these leaders that you meet, what, what in your eyes is an actual good agency leader? I mean, what are some of their characteristics? Um, I think they, are pretty self-aware. They know what they're good at and what they're not good at. Uh, I think they have a really strong vision of where they're trying to go, which a lot of agency owners do not. Mm -hmm. That's part of what we help them do is sort of define what am I building and why and how quickly can we get there? Right. Um, I think that they have a deep love of people, their clients, their employees. Like they are good people who want to be 
ethical and loyal and all of those things. And so sometimes what that means is they get their heart broken, right? right? So right. because clients ditch them, employees leave and start their own agency and compete with them. Mm -hmm. But somehow they stay true to who they are and mm -hmm. they just know that that's the price of being how they are. Um, I think they're super smart. They're just really wicked smart. And, and they are constantly learning. So agency, great agency owners know that they cannot bank on what they did four years ago right. to be doing it for clients now, right? So, right. so they, they set the example inside their agency for um, this is a lifelong learning gig. And if you aren't willing to keep learning, keep earning certifications, keep watching TED Talks or webinars or reading books or going to conferences, if you're not willing to keep adding to your skill set, then odds are your career in an agency is pretty truncated. Drew, I want us to take our final break and then I want to come back and I want to talk about your book and sell with authority. Is that fair? Let's do it. All right. Yeah. This is the AdCast. Thank you for listening to the AdCast, the podcast for marketers and advertisers. Please be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, wherever podcasts are found. To hear your questions answered on a future segment, send them to Eric at heyimeric.com. All right, I am back with my guest, Mr. Drew McClellan. And uh, now you guys understand exactly why I've been following him and listening to him for over 200 episodes. Uh, this gentleman provides some great value. He knows his stuff. And truthfully, I was one of those, Drew, that had no idea what we were actually doing. And when you started saying AGI, AGI, it's like, now I need to pay attention to this. Because the truth is, sometimes like even the accountants that would do work for us, they don't understand. They don't no, understand. No, they don't. They, they talk general accounting, but they don't understand agency math. And it's mm -hmm. very different. Every agency should work with an accountant who understands agency math. And in fact, I have a lot of agencies who send their accountants. We do a workshop once a year called Money Matters. Mm -hmm. And a lot of and a lot of the people in that workshop are accountants for agencies because mm -hmm. they have to learn all the metrics and all these things that you and I right. are talking about. Right. Plus a bunch more. Right. So now let's talk about sell with authority. What okay. what made you say, okay, I'm gonna write a book? And I, I think you did it in partnership with someone, but what made you say I have to just get this out. Let's talk about that book. Yeah. So um, it had been a few years since my last book. And if you're an author, you sort of feel like, oh, you know, every three or four years, I got to crank out a book. And some people certainly do it more prolifically than I do. I just don't have time. But the reason why this book was so important for me was, um, and my co-author is an agency owner named Stephen Westner. Um, and his agency is called Predictive ROI. And, and he and I we're talking a lot about the evolution of how agencies sell. Mm -hmm. And the reality is agencies now today, the buyer is 70% or more done with their buying decision before they even pick up the phone or shoot us an email. Hmm. So it's really about, they're like doing all their due diligence before they, we even know they're out there. So this idea of selling from a position of authority. So again, kind of the theme of our conversation today has been, how do you differentiate yourself from other agencies? The way you do that is that you, be, you take on a position of authority. You become an expert in something. And it can be an ex expert in a niche like we work with in the pharma industry with, for products for women over 50. It can be an audience like, boy, we know how to reach uh, millennials or moms or you know, whatever it may be. Um, or it can be a methodology like we... This is how we work that's really different from other agencies. So specialization doesn't have to be an industry. It mm -hmm. certainly can be. But nonetheless, you've got to decide what you're an expert in. And then what you do, the, the marketing side of it is, you start teaching what you know. And you start being an expert. And you start, you know, you have a podcast, or you write a book, or you do some research, or you're on the speaking circuit, or some subset of those things. And over time, you become super findable. And all of a sudden, what happens? And, and in the book, we give, I think it's 10 or 12 examples of agencies that are doing this, that literally the right fit clients knock on their door. Every day. Right, right. So, so I've had several of the of AMI agencies, agencies that we work with, that have landed their biggest client in the middle of COVID. 
And without exception, every one of those was a specialist that sold from a position of authority. And so that this book is really a how-to guide of how to build out your biz dev program once you decide that you are willing to not be a generalist anymore. I feel like during COVID, um, to me, it's almost like the reset button. I, 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 I feel like this was the time where a lot of clients were shopping. They were, sure. they were they were shopping around and I, I still remember this and I know we, we don't get everything right all the time to be honest with you but I know like with our team the first thing we said was okay let's work on ourselves right now let's right. let's put together more content let's fix our websites you know uh, let's let's work on our processes and everything else because um, I felt like that was a time that clients were shopping um, so how do you think everything since COVID has changed? agencies? I think there are some short-term changes and I think there are some long-term changes. So one of the short-term changes that we're all going to be dealing with is cash flow. So one of the things businesses are doing is they're hoarding their cash. So if you had a client that was normally paying you in 30 days, odds are it's going to be 45 or 60 days. Mm -hmm. So one of the things as an agency owner, and again, this is why understanding your agency math is so critical. One of the things as an agency owner is you have to be ready for cash to trickle in more slowly and you have to be able to run your business even though you're not getting paid as quickly as you can. And that's probably going to last for another probably nine months, I think at least. Right. Um, I think, I think it's, we're going to be, you know, back to probably spring of 2021 before everyone's like, okay, right. we sort of weathered the storm and now we can sort of begin to go back to normal. And so, you know, that's a long time for an agency to deal with cash flow issues. Yeah. I think another I think another thing is that uh, clients are nervous. They and they need sales now. Like they their coffers dried up, you know, in the spring of 2020 when pretty much everybody was paralyzed. Right. And they gotta make up for lost ground. So agencies that can make the cash register ring and prove that it was the work they did that made the cash register ring are going to be very busy agents. Yeah. No, because I agree. Right now, all the, all the CMOs are looking for is I'm trying to save my job, right. and what will save my job right now is bringing money in the door. Do you think some CMOs are afraid to partner with some agencies? Like, oh, you know, like right now, I need to be that I need to be that white light for my company versus bringing in some agency. Uh, I think that it, it's interesting. I I certainly think some, and we had been seeing this for the last couple of years. I certainly think some work is going to stay in house, like it has been. But honestly, most brands, <clears throat> when they have to cut, the first thing they cut is their in-house marketing department. Yep. So your CMO, who used to have eight people, now probably has two. And so they can't really afford, they can't pull it off by themselves. But what they aren't willing to do is partner with an agency that they are not absolutely confident mm -hmm. can do what they need to do, because otherwise they're going to lose their job. And so they are looking for the sure bet. And so agencies that can demonstrate with case studies or other examples, here's the problem you're having. We have solved this problem 17 times for other clients. Let me show you how we did it. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for reassurance. They're looking for certainty. Uh, and they are looking for somebody who's already done what they need done. Right. Drew, I want to kind of go into something that we call a lightning round. You hear that? I did. I'm ready. All right. So in this lightning round, I want to ask you about uh, certain medias today and, and how effective you feel they are or they are not. Um, and so there's no right or wrong answer here. Um, and you'd be amazed on how many people actually say they still believe in the yellow pages here on this show. Um, yeah, so I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> um, right. So uh, let's just say uh, the television medium. What do you think about broadcast television? Uh, here, let me first caveat. I think all of these are going to depend on who's doing it and where they're doing it. But I think broadcast television or broadcast media is still super powerful for storytelling, for brand building. Um, I think it's done badly mm -hmm. often. Uh, I think a lot of local spots are painful to yeah. watch, but you know what? That doesn't mean they don't work. Right. How about radio? 
I think radio is one of those things that is slowly going away. I think for most people, that's not how they're consuming audio, audio content anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, even on their drive, they're listening to a podcast or they're listening to Spotify. So yep. I think that's pretty tough other than super local. Newspaper. Yeah, I think if you're on the digital edition, probably better than the print edition. Uh, let's just say uh, online media right now. Um, digital ads, you know, Facebook ads. Uh, again, the beauty of them obviously is the measurability and the targetability, but I still see a lot of people doing them badly. When you do them well, uh, I think I think they could be amazing. And by the way, on newspapers, I'm talking daily newspapers, not right. specialty newspapers. They're they're crushing it. Wow. And how about billboards, outdoor mediums? Yeah, I mean, when you think about how outdoor has changed, I mean, really, outdoor is not just a billboard anymore. Yeah, it's not um, just turn it, here anymore. Right, right. I mean, I think they're doing some amazing creative, and I think it can still be very effective. Okay. Uh, direct mail. Direct mail is the hot new thing. It's, really? It's, I have agencies that are crushing it with direct mail because as our inboxes get more full and our mailboxes get less full, it's easier to get noticed. Again, it's, all of these depend on great creative, great messaging and all of that, but direct mail can be super powerful. I have a lot of agencies that are just doubling down on direct mail for clients because it's working. Especially when everyone was actually, um, they had to quarantine at home. You knew right. you knew when you sent right. out a mailer, everyone's going to get it because they're at home. Yeah, right. The challenge was if you only had their work address, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. That's true. And how about social media? I think social media is often misused by brands, but I think it is a great community builder when it's used well. And I think it can be a way to really have an intimate connection if your brand is willing to go that far. Drew, you have been a fantastic guest. Like you said, this was a long time coming. I am so happy to have that conversation with you today. Uh, and, uh, let's, let's tell folks exactly about your podcast and how they can find you. If you don't mind doing that for me. Sure. Um, the podcast is build a better agency. So you can find it pretty much anywhere where podcasts are, are found. Uh, we do a weekly episode. Uh, we're on about episode, I think it's 260 or so now. Um, and you know, every week new guest, every fifth episode is just me with a solo cast. Uh, and then you can find all, all all things Agency Management Institute. If you just go to agencymanagementinstitute.com, you can find out about our coaching and consulting, our workshop. We have all kinds of free stuff, eBooks and things like that. So please avail yourself to anything that would be useful to you. I want to thank our listeners for giving us their most valuable asset, which is their time. Uh, do yourself a favor. Go ahead and like this. Also, uh, tell a friend. Tell a friend to take a listen. And if you feel this podcast can be a help to you or a help to others, spread the word. I want to thank my guest today, Mr. Drew McClellan of the Agency Management Institute. You are a fantastic guest and an amazing mentor. I thank you so much for being our guest. This is the AdCast. Thanks for having me. If you feel this podcast has been a help to you or could be a help to others, please don't forget to subscribe. You can listen to our podcast anywhere, iHeart, Spotify, Apple Music, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And this episode is also going to be available on YouTube. To catch up on past episodes, go to heyimeric.com, or you can always text me at 843-483-1555. Copyright VIP Marketing and Advertising, produced by Craft Creative. For premium video production and graphic design, visit WeCraftCreative.com.